my name is Boya. I'm one of the organizers. Uh, this over here is Petar. He's the second organizer. And we have another guy that's missing here. His name is Luca. The three of us are going to be your hosts for the entire year of meetups. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we can have a round of applause and do the first talk, which is going to be for my friend Luca. Taxi. He was on one side of the street, I was on the other. He was small, I'm smaller, so we missed each other mm -hmm. for like 10 minutes. Yeah, luckily he didn't charge them, so that's fine. Okay, my name is uh, Luca, I come from Zagreb. I'm a software engineer for about 10 years or something like that. And uh, today I'm going to be ranting about how to maintain peace by preparing for war. Okay, so this is a very rentable talk. Uh, I'll just uh, share my experiences, my frustrations, my uh, successes. Uh, probably not, there aren't so many. So uh, this will be something that I learned along the way as I grew from uh, junior to whatever I am now. Yes, uh, but that's also undefinable because, you know, Whenever you meet somebody, you feel like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, then you meet somebody and then, oh fuck, I'm still junior, yeah, so, that's it. But, uh, let us begin. This is uh, one of my uh, least favorite quotes because it means that, uh, you know, everything you do, everything you plan is useless, but the process of planning actually means something and helps you to deal with the consequences later on in the life or in the project. So. How do we uh, start as a developer uh, from the beginning or as a new guy on a project, whether it's a new project or old project? So basically uh, you should read the documentation, whether it's the documentation on your project, on the library you're using, framework you're using, or uh, actually docs. Uh, this is especially useful for if you're a junior, and you're uh, first guy in a company. And then they say, we have this huge, big, uh, beautiful project. And then you say, yeah, but what's it about? And then they show you the code. And they say, yeah, that, that's it, that's the project, that's the code. And you say, okay, but what does it do? What does it mean? And they say, well, it's all in the code. Yes, uh, runway. Oh. Uh, of course, while you're Reading, uh, you should actually try to absorb uh, as much as you can, practice, so you can actually produce something not necessarily of high quality or quality at all, but something. So you, you get the feeling how to produce anything, even if it's a box. Uh, since this is Python talk and I'm a Python developer, this is one of the things that we often uh, overlook. Standard library is full of very, very useful things, so you don't have to do it, they did it already, so use standard library, read Python documentation, uh, it's a very beautiful thing. And apart from daytime issues, uh, everything else is more or less okay, yeah, more or less. Learn one framework. Uh, one is enough. Uh, I started with uh, Flask, ended up in Django, and between I learned a couple of more, but basically they are all the same. You put something in, it's HTTP request, you get something out, it's response, that's it. So, learn one, learn good, and it will be easier for, to learn other, others. Libraries, uh, if you use extre external libraries that are not part of, uh, part of Python standard library, you should always read the docs, especially the fine print and defaults. That's something that uh, can bite you in the ass uh, if you don't read the defaults they use. For example, YAML, I think PyYAML package had uh, unsaved defaults by uh, Yes, yeah, so if you 
uh, actually managed to uh, submit unsafe YAML file, uh, you could do a lot of damage. Learn SQL. Even though you are a Python developer, if you are using uh, web in any way, you'll sooner or later end up with database. SQL is very good stuff. Uh, this is unfortunate for uh, us because uh, most of the libraries we have uh, or frameworks use their own ORM. Uh, Django has it, uh, SQL Alchemy is most popular and stuff like that. Uh, learn how to use one since it hides the SQL, but uh, the order here is significant. Don't skip the order. Don't learn ORM then SQL. Uh, you will be disappointed. So, now you learned something and you want to put it to good use. Uh, <laughs> yes. And you're assigned to a project. Let's say you're a mid-developer, project is already halfway in. So, you know, and you're brought in to add a couple of features. So, before you start coding, please don't do as I do and start coding immediately. Ask questions, please, from whoever, your colleagues, uh, your project manager, your product owner, uh, random guy on the street, please ask questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you start coding right away, if you think you understand, in two weeks you'll be fixing your own bugs from the start, because after two weeks maybe you'll understand what it is that you were supposed to do at the beginning, maybe. Yeah. So, Please, you know, before working, before you start working, uh, actually make sure that this is what it's, that what you want to code is uh, actually the thing that needs to be done. Uh, this is very controversial because uh, specifications often change, usually uh, right before you, your deadline and the deadline, of course, does not change, that's a given. Deadlines are, you know, something like a black hole. Once it starts, it just sucks everything in and that's it. So, please uh, make sure that uh, while you're working, you update your specifications. That means change log uh, requirements, uh, uh, SQL migrations and stuff like that. And also make sure that if somebody else changes specification, they inform you. Or at least you ask them, please, why did you do that? I'm going to cry. Uh, leave comments in the code. Uh, I know that there's a... I actually went to a couple of talks on a couple of conferences. Half of them were, don't comment. The other half was, comment a lot. So, I'm somewhere in the middle, comment. Wherever you think that this is a problematic piece or strange, or uh, one-liner, comment one-liners, please. You, you'll thank yourself later, because one-liners are meaningful now when you write them two days, three days after, you don't know what you did. So, comment. Also, so, now you started, you actually know how to do, you know what to do, and then you want to start your project or define what, what you need to do to, to actually bring something to your employer. So, how do you choose what to use to solve your task? So, it's uh, basically what you need uh, versus features that the library or framework has. Uh, is it stable enough for you? Do you want it in production or are you running just uh, some proof of concept? Uh, this is actually one of the top reasons uh, we discarded a couple of frameworks because they weren't stable enough and we need them in production so yeah, it's, it's, uh, if they change more often than your code uh, it's not going to work yeah. uh, do they have defined roadmap? Uh, if they don't have a roadmap, if they don't have any idea what they'll be doing in a couple of years or one month from now uh, skip it, don't use it uh, if there aren't any maintainers, or it's just one guy, skip it, don't use it. He can be hit by a bus and then, what's, yeah, you have to maintain that shit. So, 
Now you have everything. So, how do you structure your code? Uh, you need to plan for the future. You need to plan for the next sucker who's going to inherit your code. And he's going to be going through all that steps that you got, went through just now, and then he will come to your code and say, okay, I need to start all over again. Yeah. So, write change log. That's the entry point to your project. Uh, README also, that's part of the documentation. Somebody needs to set up a workable README. So once you open up your project, you open up README file, you need to be able to set up your project without any additional inputs from anybody. If uh, README and all the other make files and stuff like that, what you have, are not sufficient to start your project, update them as you go along, please. You'll thank yourself later. And your colleagues who will come after you won't kill you. So, how do you structure your project and your code? I prefer modules. Uh, I don't like microservices from the beginning. That's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is you start big with a huge chunk of monolith, divide it into modules, and then if you need ever to scale so much that you need microservices, you just pull one module from your monolith. It will be easier. Uh, that means that you have to maintain contracts between modules. Uh, I prefer not to import anything other than interfaces. So uh, think of your module as a part of the bigger uh, code with only inputs and outputs exposed. Uh, exposed. And that's it. Uh, if you expose anything else, any internal stuff, You'll be coupled and then uh, forget about microservices, you'll, stuck, you'll be stuck with monolith and then uh, that's it. You'll have to maintain that monolith. Also changes will be very, very difficult. So please make sure that if you structure your code in monoliths and use modules, use them as you would a microservice. Uh, keep the surface uh, of integration between modules as little as possible, as small as possible, a couple of functions or one interface or, or something like that. Also, if you're using, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, integrations with uh, somebody else, with, uh, for example, uh, you need something uh, export-import from uh, ERP or uh, from SFTP or from whoever knows, uh, please uh, encapsulate it with contracts and inside the module uh, that you control the input to. So if somebody, something changes on the uh, third party library or your uh, provider or they change uh, software that uh, exposes uh, imports or exports to you, you don't need to change everything in your code, you just need to change the integrating part of your code. So please wrap it around uh, same interfaces uh, with contracts so you can test your part and then if something changes you just need to change in one part and that's the integration or you switch library and then you're safe don't test libraries that you don't own that will save you a lot of, a lot of time so this is a basically stupid example of how to use uh, inheritance in python why would you like to use inheritance in python uh, because of modules, this is, you know, uh, nothing, nothing special. But this is one way you can uh, actually expose third-party interfaces uh, in your code. You just provide a couple of methods, start fetch data, and what it does, you don't care how it uh, fetches data, does it need to start, it needs to check in the implementation itself, for example. So this is something that you could, can use, not like this, but better. This is all it could fit on the page. Yeah. <laughs> so, also use uh, composition. Don't uh, I don't in Django. If you go to list up review, for example, this is part of Django. It inherits list. It inherits uh, something else, and the inheritance chain is huge. And then you come along and write this, and this is the end. Yes. And when you have to debug, you have to go up. I think twenty or something classes to find where the, something changed. So I prefer the bottom part where you actually inject your uh, dependencies uh, and you use composition rather than inheritance. 
Also, you can do this in uh, initialize, so you can actually use dependency injection uh, if you do this in uh, init method. And you set uh, pagination class, other classes, and stuff like that. You pass it along at once you instantiate. So that's also good. Also, don't use the first one, arcs, keyword arcs. Uh, if you change something, you won't have absolutely no idea what changed. Uh, the last one is for me the best way how to write something that actually accepts more than two arguments. Uh, this is my maximum. If you need to pass more arguments than this, use an object. Please, it, it will be easier to maintain. If you have 20 or something arguments to your function, something will somewhere go wrong. You'll switch them, you won't name them correctly, and it won't. Uh, use type hints. This is before type hints. And use type hints. It will help you in Python 3. So, why did I say that you need to do all this uh, in this, in this uh, exact order? Because this is something that you will do, be doing all over again on each project, in each sprint, on each task. You will have to go to the old change log, see what happened last, update your documentation with the changes you did, structure your code accordingly, maybe refactor, remove, and repeat again. So this is not something that you will be doing once in your lifetime, this is something that you will be doing well, on a daily basis. And once you go to the end, then you'll start from the beginning. You'll get new task, new project, and you'll have to read the documentation, learn new library. For example, if your code lives for more than two years, you'll have to update everything at least twice in those two years, if you want to keep yourself uh, from breaking changes and from safety issues. So you'll have to go back to your code, relearn it, see what uh, dependencies you have, read those documentations, read those change logs, rinse and repeat every six months at least, if you want to keep your code up to date, and that's a uh, lot of work, a lot of work. And yeah, you need to do it. Uh, also, uh, how do you keep up with the changes? Uh, like I said, this will be something that you'll be doing on a daily basis. Well, again, you read, you experiment, you rest. This is the most important piece of advice I can give you. Rest. Take vacations. What about GraphQL? No. <laughs> no, no. Don't, don't, don't go there. And, uh, repeat. Uh, why I don't like GraphQL? Because uh, it does everything uh, a good REST API does, only bad. And, and uh, especially if you have something that's uh, easily cacheable in REST API, you can't easily cache it in GraphQL. That's a niche. You don't want to return hundreds of data that's easily, easily cacheable because it's not uh, changeable, so it doesn't change so often, and you write GraphQL, and then you have to load 20 megabytes of JSON just for what? Show pretty pictures. Yeah, no, don't use it. But that's just my opinion. I'm partial to REST API because I'm old school and I like to keep things simple. If I want something, you get it from me. If you want to update something, you please put something, post, patch, delete, use those and don't tell me what I need to do on the backend by pouring some mediocre SQL <laughs> wannabe like language down my throat. No, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. So, these are some useful links, but let me just repeat last two. Rest repeat. These are crucial. You know, at the end of each day, if you can't go to sleep, if you think about work, that means you're or worked or stressed and it won't last. Believe me, you'll break at some point or you'll start uh, you know, doing stuff you shouldn't, like hiking or you know, something like that. So, yeah, I just last, no, the weekend before last I was uh, on a mountain, four and a half thousand meters 
up in the air uh, trying to clear my head. Uh, didn't work. I was just tired and a couple of hundred of euros cheaper. Yeah. Uh, so, these are a couple of useful links that I'm going to leave you with. This is something that I started with, not necessarily in that order, but uh, this Serious Python is a very good book. It has a chapter on how to choose library or framework. Uh, it's very good. Martin Fowler has some nice, nice advices, especially on refactoring, so you should give it a look. And these are all uh, more or less uh, Documentation about uh, Flask or uh, Flask API. Uh, this is something that I frequently uh, use because it changes. The libraries and framework change. Uh, they have bug fixes, they have uh, some features somebody paid them to do or they wanted to introduce. So you need to keep up with the changes. You need to actually take time, preferably paid by your employer to maintain your code by updating dependencies you have. And uh, please fix your dependencies. Don't use uh, you know, asterisks and wildcards. Uh, make sure that you test in development any changes when you upgrade. Uh, I hope you have tests. If you don't, well, you can always test in production. That works. Tried it. Clients are very, very appreciative. Uh, so, now, enough of with my rant, uh, do you have any questions or, yeah, the guy in the back. So, uh, you mentioned a couple of frameworks like Django and Flask, you consider it, uh, I think you, you do consider them good or maybe best? Usable. Yes. Nice that's, 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 uh, that's all you need from a framework, it needs to be usable, it needs to meet your needs. Ah. Okay, uh, and you mentioned like you tried in other frameworks and uh, you consider them unstable. Uh, can you mention a couple of it? What did uh, you try? We, uh, yeah, we, we tried Face, Face API when it was still in uh, its early stages and we had to postpone for at least three months because the, the API still was volatile. So we took uh, an early dive. We were early adopters. Uh, now it's quite stable. Mm -hmm. uh, still not version one, so yeah, that's uh, also that's why you need to keep up with the changes because it's still not stable version. But uh, it's stable enough for us. And uh, uh, but when we were reviewing it, it was still young. It had one maintainer. Uh, roadmap was at least seven pages long. So the guy wanted everything. But he started off uh, very, very uh, simple with uh, a use case that's, uh, you know, I want something that's simple, that doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, but if you actually need it, you can just use plugins and write, your co write the code yourself. So that's what we need. We need something to get out of the way and just handle HTTP part and uh, some serialization, deserialization. He actually used Pydentic, we love Pydentic. Uh, he used uh, JSON for input-output, excellent. With Pydentic, it just works. And uh, he didn't uh, use any ORM, so we chose SQL Alchemy. Uh, because now SQL Alchemy, after version 1.4, is going full async and goes back to the basics. Uh, we used extensively SQL Alchemy core. Uh, I don't like session in uh, SQL Alchemy, uh, it's messy. Uh, that's one of the documentations I don't like, SQL Alchemy, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and the second question, when you... Uh, on the page, when you describe, were describing uh, how to choose framework, uh, you didn't mention one thing I, I think is crucial, at least for me, like it's experience. If your whole command is experienced in one framework, and you, you see that uh, the framework... Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, I forgot that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, It was in the notes, but I actually didn't. Yeah, notes. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> uh, the first thing 
before features, yes, experience. Your, uh, if your team has any experience in any framework, use it. That's, that's it. That's, that's the best thing. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your speech about testing, you, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, very important and I think you should write it somewhere in the slides because the integration and unit testing will help us a lot, especially if you are, uh, if you are a new in project, you can learn from tests so you can, um, and we need to maintain them, that's how we are trying to do it. Uh, that's a very excellent point. Uh, I didn't because uh, usually I just presume, yeah, presumption, the mother of all fuck-ups, I just presume that there are tests. Yeah. And, and uh, they weren't without tests. Yes, I... We, 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 did, we, did, we did a lot of projects without tests. We start starting with tests, then at some point we stop using them and stop maintaining them and then we don't get it. But uh, we're trying not to do this now, but... Uh, <laughs> then, this first... Without test, you cannot code for the future. Because if you want to refactor something and you don't have tests, uh, it will be very, very painful. I uh, actually had to refactor a lot of code that didn't have any tests. I spent a better part of a month writing tests to actually see what the code does. So I poked around with inputs, wrote tests, and saw what what exactly does it receive as an input. So I threw everything I could at it, and then I had a test for inputs. And then I knew, okay, this is what it accepts, this, no. So those tests need to fail when you actually change the code. And then I, uh, and when I say freeze it, I mean you build it, you backup it, you backup it again, put it on a couple of locations so you have it. Because, uh, for example, I'm still running in production code that runs on Ubuntu 10.04. Uh, so. 10, 10 years ago. Yes. Okay. And it works. Yeah. It's just not maintainable anymore. Yeah, yeah. There are no libraries, there are no packages, nothing works. So it needs to work. So backups are here very, very important. Unfortunately, that's all you can do. If you don't have time to update it, uh, to bring it up to speed with the, the rest of the world. You can only pray that you will go to pension before you need to update it even further. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel sorry for you. Been there, done that, still doing it. <laughs> it's not easy. And uh, it won't get easier. So, I think I'm almost out of time. Any more questions? Oh, this was excellent. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, find me afterwards if you want to discuss anything else. I'll be here until well, tomorrow. Right. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, our next talk is going to be by Max, and the topic I forgot, but I think it's related to unit performance testing. What? Performance testing? Okay, not unit test, performance testing. But while uh, Max is setting up his device, I'm going to play a little game with you guys. So, uh, I told you that this meetup, this is a meetup, it's not like, you're not at a conference when somebody's going to just like talk and you're going to sit there and ask questions. No, you have to participate a bit. So, I'm going to start by introducing a bit, you know, everybody with each other. What we're going to do is, we're going to go like in an order, and you're going to say, Hi, my name is Boyan. I woke up today at 8 a.m. by an alarm from my girlfriend. And then again at 8.15. And then again at 8.30. So that was my morning. How about you? Hi. Similar for me, but it was half past seven. No, hi, hi, my I, name I'm is... Zara. I'm Zara, my name is Zara, and I woke up it's 7.30 this morning and it was not stressful so much as... Uh, okay, we don't have a lot of time. Go, let's go. Next guy. Next one. I am Sobolen and I wake my night phone every, every morning at 6. 6 a.m. Yeah. What about you, sir? Me? Yeah. Oh, my name is Igor and also I wake up at 6.30. 6 30. You see my girlfriend wake up because she needs to work earlier for me. But my wife, sorry. <laughs> you, sir? 
Hi, my name is Lorca and I woke up at uh, 7 a.m. by 24. <laughs> Very impressive. What about you, sir? Hi, my name is Nicola. I woke up there at 8 o'clock. What about you, sir? <laughs> In the corner. <laughs> my name is Robert. I woke up around 10 o'clock, as always. My name is Michelle. I wake up at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. 9 a.m. Marco. 9 a.m. Marco. Hi, I'm Luca. I woke up at 7, just like the other room. <laughs> what about you, Miss? Uh, my name is Marina. Uh, I woke up at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Uh, my name is Mikhail, and I woke up at 5.50. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up at 5.50. I woke up at 5.50. I woke Hello, I'm Sasha. Around 10. 10. Oh, that's not like 20 minutes to waking up. But you, I'm, Miss? I'm Stefan. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Maya. I, I was going to wake up at 9, but it was the first day after vacation, so I wasn't able to wake up at 9. It was 9 a.m. Hmm. You, sir? I'm Stefan, and I wake up usually at 6 30 and Yeah. Early. Do we get a test of this afterwards? <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. Christina, I wake up at 7 30. Christina, 7 30. I'm Alexei, I wake up at 7 a.m. I'm on and it's 7 a.m. You sir? I'm still and I woke up around 12. <laughs> we gotta do it quicker. Uh, it's I, good. I'm Alexia, I woke up at 3 p.m. 3, 3 p.m. Very, <laughs> very good, very good. Alright, Alex uh, woke up at 8.30. Alex at 8.30. I am a respondent, uh, usually I'm uh, waking up at uh, 8.55, but today <laughs> is uh, 7.30. Good. Hi, my name is Miroslav. I usually woke up around half past eight. Half past eight. Hi, I'm Matija. I woke up tired at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, that's good. Hi, I'm Delito. I wake up at 10. Very good time. Hi, I'm Jaya. I woke up today. I woke up at 10 just before first call. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Maxim. I woke up at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Oh, 8 p.m. Okay. <laughs> You, sir, in front? Hi, my name is Mitei. You said it's going to remind me of that. That's good. Hi, I'm Yakub, and I woke up at 8 a.m. July for 6 a.m. Wow. I woke up at 9. You know, without any odds. That's all right. Very bad state here. Hi, Paul, I didn't wake up this morning. Nice. You? At yeah, What's your name? I'm sorry, you forgot? Alex. No, no, the guy next to you. That didn't Pavel. wake up at all. What? Pavel. Pavel. Okay, big round of applause for Pavel. <laughs> and the next talk is going to be by Max. So. Oh, wow. Max. Woo! When you woke up. Okay, I'm Max. <laughs> uh, I don't remember when I woke up. <laughs> uh, I think around 8 p.m. Oh, so, uh, I'm Max and I'm actually uh, speaking at this uh, Python uh, Belgrade meetups uh, already for the second uh, time. Uh, the first time uh, was in April, uh, so it's nice to uh, see some of you again here. <laughs> Uh, and it was a very uh, nice meetup uh, back then in April and we had a very nice party after uh, the meetup. It was so nice so that in the middle of the night my wife tried to call me and <laughs> I didn't answer and she started to think that uh, I was lost or killed or something. <laughs> But when the, she finally uh, called me, uh, I said, everything is okay, don't worry, I'm on the meetup. <laughs> so, uh, it was really nice and later people uh, told me that it's usually, it's often like this in Belgrade. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I decided to, to move to Belgrade. <laughs> Then I was uh, living in Czechia, uh, so we relocated with the family, now we are living here and probably you will see me more often on these meetups. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, the story about uh, me, uh, a slide about me, started to code about 19 years ago and then after uh, 11 years of coding for free people uh, thought that I'm good enough 
and started to pay money uh, for coding. Uh, now I'm a software engineer working for uh, Kiwi.com, it's a company on this uh, roll-up. And I'm originally from uh, Russia, Siberia, and ended up here in Serbia. Uh, Kiwi, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, why is this in Prague though? It's not in Belgrade. Uh, I just <laughs> moved just. <laughs> Change. <laughs> yes, I don't have photos in Belgrade. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Kiwi.com, uh, it's a, a service that helps to find uh, cheap and nice uh, travel options, maybe flight tickets, uh, and uh, Actually, uh, we need 400 engineers to develop and maintain such a service to find cheap flight tickets, and while I'm one of them. Uh, we use uh, many cool modern technologies, so you can see uh, so many uh, cool tech words here. And today uh, I wanted to talk about uh, performance uh, testing of Python uh, services. Uh, actually, uh, it's not necessarily uh, related to uh, Python services, uh, it can be a service in uh, any programming language, but it is a uh, Python Belgrade meetup, so I had to use the word Python in the title, <laughs> or otherwise Boyan uh, would not <laughs> accept my application. <laughs> so we'll talk about performance testing of Python uh, services. Uh, performance testing can be actually uh, different, there are different uh, types of performance testing depending on what actually uh, you are going to test. Uh, it can be a uh, load testing uh, when uh, you are trying to uh, test stability of your service under some certain uh, level of load. Uh, it can be uh, Stress testing when you can when you are trying intentionally uh, break something in your service with uh, too high load, or it can be scalability testing uh, when you are trying to uh, test how your service uh, scales under increasing load. Uh, do you have something uh, like this uh, in your projects? Uh, raise your hands who have something. Okay, depends on the project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Uh, and now, uh, who have any tests in your projects? Also, residents. Oh, much more, much more. <laughs> uh, and I think uh, this um, proportion is actually uh, representative. It's uh, really like this. We uh, almost always have some tests in our uh, projects, but uh, not always have performance. Uh, testing, so it's not uh, that common. Uh, and I think this is because um, uh, effort uh, needed to implement and uh, maintain uh, performance tests compared uh, to value uh, that, that it gives, it's not uh, very attractive actually. Uh, and uh, let's try to think why. Maybe you know uh, the test uh, pyramid. So uh, we have uh, unit test, integration test, and to end tests. Uh, and this uh, pyramid actually says that uh, we should have uh, many uh, unit tests, uh, not that many integration tests, and just a few end to end tests. Uh, because uh, unit tests are usually uh, simple uh, to develop, or to, to implement, to maintain. Uh, and as we are going high uh, in this uh, test pyramid, uh, tests become more complex, uh, it's more difficult to implement and maintain them, and they are more difficult to run, they are usually slower. Uh, and uh, what do you think, where is the place for performance test in this pyramid? Any ideas? At all the stages. At the top. Uh, at the top. Uh, well, uh, I think mostly yes, but not uh, necessary. Uh, theoretically, we can uh, have some uh, performance test.
tests of some small units of our code, actually. They are not very useful, I think, but uh, we can do it you know, if we want. And the same for integration tests. Uh, but uh, uh, most useful uh, performance tests are actually end-to-end -end tests. That, that's true. And probably this is why uh, they are not that common. Uh, uh, that's just because it's difficult to maintain, difficult uh, to implement and uh, to run them. That, that's just uh, what I think, some, some of my <laughs> ideas about it. Uh, so, do we really need performance tests if it's also difficult? Uh, and uh, I think it depends on the project. And we decided at some point that for one of our services we needed uh, such tests uh, because we were in the end of, of the uh, pandemic and it was some uh, recovery and we expected uh, market recovery and the people will start travel much more uh, will use uh, our services much more and will uh, have much more uh, load on our services and we wanted to be sure uh, that our service uh, will be uh, able to handle uh, such increased uh, load and that uh, it will be possible to scale uh, our service uh, if it will be needed. Uh, so uh, we started uh, with performance tests and in our case uh, it was mostly scalability testing uh, because basically we wanted to ensure that our service uh, scales uh, well enough. Uh, and it was end-to-end -end, uh, testing, as we just discussed, it's probably uh, most uh, useful because we can, uh, uh, we can get some uh, uh, useful uh, information uh, analyzing our results of, of the test. Uh, uh, we uh, prepared uh, target uh, load uh, levels based on uh, real usage uh, of the API of the service uh, and based on uh, predictions, expectations uh, from our management on uh, how, uh, how the market is going to recover. Uh, so we used uh, current uh, load and some uh, and multiplied it by uh, by some number given us by uh, the manager. Uh, and uh, then uh, to have our tests uh, realistic, uh, we needed to uh, prepare a realistic test uh, data. Uh, because if we uh, used uh, some uh, fake or uh, in invalid uh, data, uh, most probably uh, we will not get a lot um, similar to what we uh, have with real data because uh, invalid data will be just rejected uh, and uh, it would not get uh, into processing that actually creates load or main load on our service uh, so uh, we had to uh, implement uh, generators uh, for such test uh, data uh, to make it uh, similar uh, to real and to make it uh, consistent uh, so uh, that it really uh, reproduces uh, the real data. And we used uh, Logos. Uh, it's a tool for uh, performance testing in Python. Uh, we uh, decided to use it because uh, we could uh, just uh, prepare test scenarios uh, in plain uh, Python uh, and it's a simple uh, tool to use. It was uh, nothing uh, complicated. It seemed uh, straightforward, and it actually was straightforward uh, to uh, prepare such tests uh, with Locus. Uh, and then, interesting uh, next interesting uh, part of our uh, performance test uh, is that uh, we had to do something with external uh, services. Uh, that were called by our service when it processed uh, incoming requests. Uh, uh, and uh, because just we didn't want to break uh, some of external services that we used, 
uh, and they are mostly uh, banks in our case. <laughs> we didn't want to load them uh, uh, too much. And we couldn't uh, uh, expect uh, some uh, predictable response times uh, from them. Uh, so we implemented our own uh, mocks of external services uh, that returned uh, us some uh, predictable uh, data with uh, given uh, uh, response times uh, and uh, those response times uh, were based on uh, real uh, usage statistics of uh, those external services uh, so we uh, tried to simulate uh, real external services with our mocks uh, and then we just uh, set up test environment uh, reproducing uh, our production environment this part was very simple, we just did all the same that we had in production and then we finally uh, were able to uh, run our uh, performance tests. Uh, and uh, we got some results out of those tests uh, and uh, it turned out that it's actually difficult uh, to have some uh, automatic uh, interpretation of the test results, so to have some uh, program or script that would analyze them and say just passed, failed, uh, it's difficult to make such uh, for performance uh, tests, so we had to interpret them manually. So we just saw the output, analyzed it and decided if it's okay or not okay. Uh, and uh, our test uh, load was quite realistic and personally I was impressed with this uh, result. Uh, when we uh, run tests uh, with exactly the same load that we had uh, in production, uh, we uh, got metrics uh, from the service under the test that was different just in 10 to 20 percent from real. And that was really uh, nice and uh, I think it means our tests were accurate uh, enough and uh, good. Uh, and uh, we were able to uh, prove that our system was scalable uh, enough. So we uh, run, uh, we ran our test with uh, increased load, with target load, uh, so that we can really scale our system. And uh, basically, we answered on our initial uh, question that yes, we can uh, scale our system. Uh, and also we were able to identify bottlenecks so when it comes to too high load uh, we were able to see where's the bottleneck and uh, based on it we prepared a scaling strategy uh, for our service uh, and also uh, one interesting uh, result of this uh, work on performance testing was that mocks of external services that uh, we implemented were also useful for end-to-end -end tests uh, of our system uh, and uh, uh, because just initially when we started to work uh, on uh, this performance testing we uh, didn't have end-to-end -end tests but uh, after that uh, when we uh, implemented it and we had lots of external services uh, it was easier to add such end-to-end -end testing having already uh, this works. Uh, but unfortunately we spent too much time, <laughs> to, uh, so it was really uh, quite an effort to, to implement uh, all these uh, things. Uh, and uh, looking back uh, at our experience uh, with, with this performance testing in this concrete case, uh, I think probably we could uh, just analyze uh, 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 data matrix uh, of how uh, our services were used uh, then uh, see uh, what load actually was uh, uh, created back then and try to extrapolate <laughs> uh, this data and just uh, get almost the same result not that accurate, uh, not that that can be uh, trusted but it would be much much <laughs> easier. So uh, that's, uh, that's it about our experience uh, with performance uh, testing and some of our conclusions. Do you have any questions? 
Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> uh, tell me, please, uh, did, you, did you copy any data from production to to make it look more? Uh, like yes, that. yes. As I said, uh, we um, implemented our uh, generators of uh, data um, uh, so that they uh, produce data very similar to production, not real, but yes. similar to production. But question was another. Did you copy any data? Copy? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, what kind of tools did you use for for those generators? Maybe some kind of frameworks? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, factory boy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this one uh, was my main use. Do you see a uh, uh, faker? Uh, well, yes, it's actually used by factory boy. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is it factory boy deprecated by something else? Mm, not sure. Uh, uh, no, I'm not sure what factory boy is. What uh, is factory boy? Uh, it, it's a, a framework uh, to uh, generate uh, fake models right. <laughs> for this. Is that a Django thing? Or uh, no, no, it's, okay. it's a separate from Django. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what was your team structure and who did all of this? Uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you won. Uh, yes, uh, I won. Uh, our team was five. Engineers. On which team and just you did the performance? Oh, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. mostly. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, oh, but the, the other guys were working on some other tasks. So. <laughs> <laughs> and team confidence level uh, with your system, did it rise up when? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, sure. Uh, at least in terms of uh, scalability, uh, yes, for sure. And uh, also with that, uh, now it uh, enabled us to uh, have nice end to end. It's, uh, it's still not complete, but at least we have a uh, part of, of things ready for end-to-end -end tests now. Okay. Yes, but you say that it's hard to measure how successfully the test is. Yes. Did you integrate it in uh, continuing to integrations, like in pipelines of... Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, yes, it's partly uh, integrated, but we uh, don't uh, run it, for example, on every merge request or something, because uh, to run all this uh, thing, it takes Take time. So. Uh, yeah. Yes, quite so a while. You just run it uh, manually when you want. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. exactly. But we have uh, CI CD setup uh, to uh, to deploy it, to deploy the setup for performance testing. Mm -hmm. Because like, in our we also have a question like, should we run it every time, or what should we do? And we decide, okay, let's just run it when we think it's necessary. Uh, our approach is to run when necessary. Yeah. Yes, because to run every time it's too much. <laughs> I can add a couple of thoughts on this topic. Yes, in our sure. project, what we do, we do actually run micro benchmarks, but we run them not on every commit, but rather scheduled or on like overnight. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we not just run them overnight, but every time we tag up, we want to release our software, we also execute them, and at that time, we also uh, we use a criterion tool, and this tool is also capable of generating JSON files, basically saving the statistics of, mm -hmm. of the micro benchmarks. And the next release, when we do the next release, we can compare a uh, new JSON file with the previous one, and that way we can detect if uh, something hit our performance, so we can like, uh, it doesn't fail the bill, but we at least can talk to our client and tell that because of this feature, our performance, uh, we, 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 are over, uh, we see the performance degradation. Mm -hmm. well, was that compared automatically or uh, in user? Yeah. Uh, the criterion, it, 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 you can kind of pass a, a parameter and, uh, and tell where to uh, find the previous result and just uh, 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 put the graphic statistics. Uh, I mean, uh, could it tell from the uh, results, from the data uh, in the results, uh, that uh, there is degradation or there is no yeah, degradation? Yeah, sure. Yes, sure. Oh, nice. I have one more question. It's like, uh, I read, for example, in Amazon, they just run a performance testing uh, without pauses. Just on production, they also put uh, some extra stress on it. What do you think about this? Like, 
uh, to put extra stress in production. Yes. <laughs> you, you just like try to kill the production by itself. <laughs> if it doesn't uh, kill them, it's good enough. Well, we were not thinking about <laughs> <laughs> to kill our production. You should try. You should try. Okay, well, we should try. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Right, any more questions? I have a personal question. Yes. Why did you decide to move from Prague, from Czech Republic to Serbia? Oh, it's, uh, I would say, family circumstances, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have better view. <laughs> In terms of view, not, not sure, not sure. <laughs> right, if there are no more questions, let's give a round of applause for Max. Stopwatch or timer? I assume it's time. Five, five, five. <laughs> All right. So uh, the first talk is going to be by Anton, yes. and you have five minutes, sir. Okay, nice. Hello, everybody. I'm Anton. I came to Serbia six months ago. I'm from Russia, and I'm by the developer. I, I'm mostly I'm Pebuzetic. And so, what we use uh, with like newcomers with Russian mostly, we build community. It's called a Serbian IT Pebuzetic, and like. It's a lot of new programmers who arrive to Serbia and they're looking for event for meetups. And for example, I discovered this event and I will like advertise it in this community. And what I want to do, so I want to integrate somehow Russian developers to like to local community to like to make something good. And if you're interested to join, like we have chat in Telegram, it's like a Russian WhatsApp. And now we have uh, 800 uh, members and we're gonna grow because like a new company came, new people came. And like, it's a link, it's possible to read, but still, Serbia underscore self underscore IT. Like, everybody could join. You can generate a QR code from that. Yeah. <laughs> Make it uh, big. Uh, uh, generally, if you, if you have four minutes, so take your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I, I will send it to you. Uh, no, 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 you can post it here. Live coding. Live coding, let's go, three minutes. <laughs> No, I think it's from the app. Uh, yes. uh, no. uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, be, no, no, I like, you can write it in the Python it's in the library. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's oh, 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 I'm sorry. sorry. So, okay, this link, and like, the point is just like, if you just to integrate with Russians, because Russians are interested in integrating through the Serbia community, feel free to join this. And like, I hope in the next month it will it's be more Russian. Russian. Huh? It's in Russian. It's in Russian, like, but you can write in English and like we can switch. So, but yeah. If you're going, I see here Robert, so you're already gossiping me. I don't like it. Huh? <laughs> oh, very good. What? <laughs> what? Never mind. <laughs> okay, so this was the point. Just like we have big Russian community of Predozetic. And like you know about it now. <laughs> we have two more minutes, come on. What are you talking about in those? Like actually, initially, like imagine you're foreign, you're Russian, like you kind of understand Serbian, like how it's in Treba, and uh, you go to move, you go to like run in the wallet center, and you don't know what to say, where to go, and so we kind of uh, share all knowledge with what we have with each other and try to help. So. It's not tech related this I mean I hope it will grow to tech related because now like everybody set up the Zetnik and like what should they do next? They should like do some tech stuff. And we just gather 700, 800 programmers. Almost. So they could do something and I hope they will do. Okay. Like we all said that so like, we should like this is yeah, two more minutes, go on. Oh, that's like <laughs> <a good one. laughs> yeah, extra time. <laughs> like maybe we have some questions. Like actually like, I'm from Navisat and I really like that you have here in Belgrade such a meetups. Because in Navisat we have Russians dating meetups, for example. So if somebody in machine learning and understands Russian, feel free to ask me, I will give you the link to open data science meetup. We start at 8 a.m. today. Uh, like and we have a breakfast and discuss some machine learning stuff. That's it. Okay, I have one minute more. Uh, <laughs> in in, in, in Thursdays in Neustadt, we have like 
language to change club, yeah, I just wanted to share interesting stuff, you know. Uh, like, it was initially local, but now it's 50 50 Russians, not Russians. Mm -hmm. And like, we speak English, German, uh, and other languages, so if you've been very sad in those days, you can join. It's also a lot of developers, like, a lot of developers from Russia. Yes. Uh, nobody else spoke from Russia. Uh, what else we have? Mm -hmm. No. Thank you. Oh, I'm 45 more seconds. Squeeze it out. Squeeze it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, I'm, I'm working in a startup called Meet CGI. If you're interested, like. Can't make your time. You can't do it. It's a single song. Generally, that's the rule of thumb. That's what we do. So we scan like feet with the VR from iPhone, direct to the model, and recommend your best shoes, which match your the model. And also say, do you have some illnesses? For example, do you have deeper pronation or do you have uh, very flat feet? So we start up with a slow clap like right. this. Yeah. And then he needs to talk. He needs to talk. <laughs> and then Wait, 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 I, I need to click, I need to figure it out. Yeah, communicate with public. Yes, you can go, you can do whatever you want. Three, two, one, off you go. Okay, this is something that uh, came to my mind 30 minutes ago. Uh, currently, I'm reading one book by Carl Newport, Digital Minimalism. I'm not sure if any one of you read it. You should try to, to read it. And I have a question for you. How many uh, social networks uh, are you connected to? Oh, uh, put your hands up with numbers, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah. practically it is uh, average of five. And uh, if it is average of five, how many time do you spend on it? <laughs> 30 minutes per day. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Three hours. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, why why I'm uh, asking this? Because I have I had that problem. Uh, out of IT space, I'm I have my salsa school, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, for, on uh, social networks, and that time killed me. Uh, so basically, besides uh, my job and my uh, uh, salsa school management, I did not have time for anything except girlfriend and family, but on low level. And uh, then uh, I, I tried to solve, solve those issues. Uh, I started with something that I think hurt less, and that is getting out of social networks. Uh, first thing that I did is delete Facebook application from my, from my phone. Uh, and <laughs> that is something that I, that I suggest for all of you. Uh, you don't need to delete uh, your account. Um, also, uh, I'm a bit older, I think, than it is average here. And that is why I'm on Facebook. I was on Facebook mostly, but now I see that everyone is on Instagram and maybe TikTok. Uh, so possibly you could, you could delete Instagram account also on phone and just stay on uh, social networks on your PC, on your private PC, not your job PC, uh, or Mac. <laughs> and uh, you, you should try uh, what, what I'm trying. Uh, I don't say that you should try, but I'm trying it, to just uh, give some uh, daily uh, time, time slots, when I could check my social accounts. Uh, and that freed me a lot of time, and that's why I'm thankful that you organized this today, because before, uh, three months ago, I could not attend this. But now I can, I can attend some, some meetups, and that is one of uh, suggestions that I... Okay, I have two minutes more. That I, that I took from this uh, book, uh, because uh, you, we need somehow to switch from. Uh, I know that it is hard, hard, uh, hard, hard topic for uh, uh, virtual, vir vir virtually inclined people, 
but uh, we need to switch from uh, virtual world to back to physical world uh, absolutely after Corona uh, because well, why, should, why should we do it? <laughs> what? Why should we do it? Why should we do it? Yeah. Because uh, there are multiple there are multiple things, and now I'm going to copy what what this guy said. Uh, physical communication, eye to eye, you know, in real physical world, is something that our body, our mind, is used to, because of uh, huge history of our uh, step by step improvement. Of, uh, Evolution. <laughs> okay, uh, we are we are used to it, uh, and social networks are something that it, that it, that was made to uh, just take our time and not give us a similar amount of uh, usefulness back. So uh, that I just want from me and then from everyone with who, whom I'm talking to think about it. Uh, what should you do in three hours instead of... Instead of